Hey, it's my pleasure to be joined by Dr. David Pepler this morning. Uh, he has served as in pastoral ministry for 22 years. He's worked for both churches and with Christian leaders, helping them better develop uh, their into their calling and their careers. David created Pep Talk Ministries recently uh, to help individuals uh, sort of explore their spiritual horizons and become everything they can in Christ. As a speaker, writer, and coach, Dave is building out a second career focused on giving back from his years of experience. Uh, Dave, it's very great to have you with me today. Mm, absolutely. Thanks so much, Brandon, for for this time to, uh, to talk about the things that uh, God has created within me to start. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Dave, I know a little bit about your past, um, but could you share a little bit of how you got into coaching and uh, why you're so passionate about it? Absolutely. Coaching is something I was introduced to in 2011 through the uh, Virginia Baptist. Um, Ken Kessler started uh, teaching coaching classes and I was among the first to experience some of these. And what I discovered right there and then in those introductory classes was that this was a, a very natural fit mm -hmm. uh it was something i have this insatiable curiosity within me that has been the way i've lived as since a child uh but also what i am passionate about is as you kind of said in the introduction to work with leaders uh, i work mostly with church leaders of course uh, but also churches themselves, to help them, when I say to discover and become everything you can be in Christ, uh, what I mean by that is to walk with you through a journey to help you find out what is happening within you that your conscious thinking doesn't always bring to the forefront. So to be able to help people um, in a profession that can be very lonely, mm -hmm. um, Pastoral leadership is the same as many CEO leadership positions and things like that. The old adage of it's lonely at the top is very real and serving as a pastor definitely provides that same atmosphere. So it's very challenging. It's very difficult and very lonely. Uh, coaching has provided me an opportunity to reach out with those leaders and help them build the relationship, uh, number one, with, with somebody. Um, who's been down the same road but then also to to take that idea into the the local church is also a big plus because i can help them discover the things that are happening within them as well uh through the coaching process yeah no that's great that's great dave a lot of people have a stigma around counseling or getting help from other people uh what makes coaching different than counseling and why may it be a better fit of towards helping leaders of get help? Well, absolutely. The and That's a great question too. The concept behind counseling is to deal with issues perhaps of the past that uh, have caused some sort of stigma or some sort of stuckness in your life today, uh, causing issues that are just difficult to deal with. And counseling is a great opportunity to be able to cope with those things and learn how to grow from those things so that you can better deal with today. Coaching is taking you from where you are to where you want to be. It has a whole lot to do with setting goals. Here's where I'm at now. There will be some conversation of how this began or maybe what brought you to this point, but most of coaching is how do you move forward from here? How do you get unstuck? How do you get out of a rut? Or how do you... Um, achieve those goals and dreams that you've been striving to achieve uh, how do you move forward and you know in my world a lot of that has to do with the life of faith but even for uh, for congregations for groups for churches i work with church staffs as well uh, to help them not just identify those goals but then to find out actionable steps how do you get there from here that are uh, very positive very uplifting it's a very encouraging relationship so coaching really is how do I get from here forward? And uh, it's not a replacement for counseling. Counseling is awesome. And I think people sometimes need both. Yeah, no, no, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. 
Dave, I remember when I first started working, there were three things that I was taught not to discuss at work, uh, religion, politics, and people's money. But the longer I have spent working, uh, the real problem I see is how you talk about those subjects in the workplace. Uh, you know, financial literacy is very important. And uh, I spend a lot of time, you know, working with people when it comes to either financial literacy or when it comes to, you know, protecting their assets. Um, I think we're beginning to see a similar trend in spirituality as well. You see things like apps like Headspace, uh, encouraging meditation in large companies, uh, breathing exercises and things like that. Uh, how do you see your spiritual coaching integrate into workplace or with leaders uh, more so now? Well, I tell you, and it is, especially for the Christian leaders, uh, pastor or just a Christian leader serving in the workplace, um, one of the things that is very challenging right now is how to exhibit your faith in a world that is not necessarily open to it. Mm. Um, and to be able to bring the coaching process to someone to help them discern what are best approaches when it comes to uh, living out your faith, um, which is going to be maybe even more important than the way you share it. If you're living it, that is a, a way of sharing your faith as well. So a lot of the coaching that I've been involved with, with helping leaders uh, is to help them find that balance, that spiritual balance, as well as work-life balance. Um, you, it's amazing how many people that I work with that I'll, some of our conversations will turn to things like time management. Uh, I don't even know what I'm doing, how to function, things like that. For the folks who are leaders within the corporate world, um, theirs is a, a, a the issues they face with their spirituality frequently are, um, how do I bring that in? How do I exhibit it without being over the top and trying to proselytize at work or, or things along those lines? Uh, how can I best be that example of what a believer uh, is going to be even though I have to make some pretty head, heady decisions, I have to sometimes do some things that are certainly not pleasant, uh, but how do I live out my faith in such a way that in, in our terms, we would say God is glorified by how I conduct myself as a leader. Sure, sure, absolutely. So Dave, you mentioned openness just a second ago, and I just had a conversation with my 15-year-old uh, son about the five major of. Uh, personality traits. And one of those is openness and closeness. And uh, it makes me wonder, how do you work with people that maybe are in, innately or personality wise more closed uh, versus open? Because we know that a lot of people just personality wise do fall into that closed category. Absolutely. Uh, I love that question too. Uh, it is it's more challenging, obviously, to, to deal with folks. I mean, I'm an external processor. So uh, when I am being coached, uh, my goodness, the coach has an opportunity to get in maybe three or four questions. I'll do the rest of the work myself uh, because I'm just kind of an open book. But when you deal with people through the coaching relationship, when you deal with people who aren't used to being so uh, candid, uh, the, the, the challenge becomes, and this is part of the coaching training that we do and things like that too, to come up with questions that are probing, uh, and yet at the same time, they're not attacking, uh, sure. uh sure. you know, we, the last thing we ever want to do is to put someone on the defensive, um, so that's why we coaches generally don't use the question that starts with the word why. Okay. Uh, because that can be kind of a question that that puts someone on the defensive, and that's not where we want them. So what we do is the the powerful questions we ask are are the ones that cause the most thinking, um, but then to also help the client to be able to express what it is that they're thinking. Uh, so it's it's really it's a matter of good questions, but quite frankly, there's something else behind that too that there, there has to be a sense of genuineness from the coach. The coach has to have that compassion for the person they're uh, coaching uh, to be 
a good listener to be able to understand, pick up on the little things that are being said along the way and say, could you say more about that? Uh, yeah, or or yeah. something along those lines. So so the compassion, the good questions, and just the listening skills alone are usually the strongest uh, tools that help someone who is a closed person kind of come out of that shell a little bit, uh, not with dramatic changes, but still it helps them with their processing, which leads to a better coaching conversation. Now, Dave, if I was to start uh, in a coaching process with you, what is it that I should expect uh, during the initial process? How would you get started with somebody? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, uh, the very first thing we do is just have a conversation about what coaching is, what coaching is not, uh, to kind of help you get a grasp on what we're dealing with. Again, you know, kind of the comparison with counseling and, right. and mentoring, which is also kind of relying on my past experience to help you cope with today mm -hmm. and so to differentiate what coaching is all about uh, but then also to talk about things like confidentiality um, you know a coaching relationship is something that i would treat you very much as if it was a counseling relationship as well uh, you know i am not going to say anything to anybody about uh, the things that we have in our uh, private conversations um Unless, of course, and just like in counseling world, if you say something that is going to indicate uh, the, the chance for harm to yourself or others or things like that, then I've got to do what I've got to do with that. But uh, but otherwise, I mean, I don't even tell other people who I'm coaching. Right. Now, I encourage the people I'm coaching to, sure, you know, feel free to, to talk me up as a coach. And, and, you know, that would, the more people I can help, the better. Um, right. I mean, that's just, that's what, that's what I'm in this for now is to help people as they continue to move through life and, and grow in their faith. Um, so the, the, we initially just have a conversation to talk about all of that, as well as just to get to know one another. Um, yeah. To, to learn some of the ins and outs and, you know, maybe do a couple of assessments if, if possible, if the person feels like that's important to talk about maybe your Enneagram or Myers-Briggs or, or things along those lines. Um, but it really, it, I, the initial conversation is something that I just find to be critically important because it gets us off to a good start. And we'll talk about what maybe some of the uh, topics you would like to be coached around. Or what is the general overview of you know where are you stuck where do you want to be things like that, um, and then the then from there we schedule the coaching conversations they're either Zoom or in person or on the phone what whatever the client prefers, um, one hour conversations and with each conversation, uh, you leave with action steps we'll start with the general idea we'll narrow it down. And then we'll take it out into, well, what, what can you do about it? And, and it's always, what can you do yeah. about it? Uh, right. So helping you generate those thoughts. And then the next session, we start with wherever the client wants to go and, and so on and so on. Gotcha. Excellent. I know one of the things that has frustrated me uh, between sort of the counseling world and the coaching world is a lot of times counseling seems to keep people uh, I don't want to say stuck in the same place because obviously they're working through and trying to get, you know, better and get through hard times or difficult situations. But coaching seems to have a much clearer path from from trying to set objectives and then reach those uh, objectives. Uh, how do you see that in your practice? Well, you know, um, another thought came to mind as you were saying that when you were talking about counseling. I also have uh, friends who are in spiritual direction mm -hmm. and some of the distinct distinctives we come up with between spiritual direction and spirituality coaching. Uh, and I would put counseling in with the spiritual direction umbrella for, for this question. Um, those practices have to do with being right. Or coaching has to do with doing uh, as a spiritual director, they're going to really help you engage with this, the presence of God within and how do you sense God being around you and with you and how do you just rest in that moment. Spirituality coaching is going to be, okay, and from there, where do you want to go? Uh, what are the things that you would like to do? And if it's a faith conversation, to grow in your faith. If it's a leadership conversation, to grow as a leader. 
or if you're dealing with a particular issue or subject that uh, you need to, to deal with. So yeah, coaching is very uh, goal oriented. It is very driven um, and it's exciting. Yeah. Because the, the client is always the expert. You know, when we're having coaching conversations, you're the expert in this. I'm just trying to help you discover those things that are within you that perhaps talking out is the way that you're going to find them. And, uh, oh, it's fantastic to to see people open up like flowers. Yeah. You know, much of my pastor at work was watching people grow spiritually. And now in coaching, and in particular spirituality coaching, it's like getting to see that more. Yeah. And on a, on a broader scale, it's just, it, it is such a blessing to be called to do this kind of work now. Sure. Absolutely. And Dave, you work with lots of different leaders, uh, especially Christian leaders. Uh, but I think the, the same question I'm going to ask would be true for Christian leaders, as well as individuals who are CEOs or managers or whatever it may be. What are the three biggest mistakes that you see of leaders make when it comes to their own personal leadership mm -hmm. um you know the first thing that comes to mind is i've encountered way too many leaders who are ego driven um you know the the fact that leadership itself innately implies that you're leading someone or some group of people to try to achieve something or accomplish something or or go somewhere if the leader leads out of uh, his or her own well i'm in charge here and i'm the one who needs to come up with all this stuff first of all that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself yeah uh, but secondly what if what if the answers are within the people you're leading mm -hmm. what if the solutions are there so the the ego i think is probably the first and biggest problem i've seen not just executives but also pastors mm -hmm. uh, who have uh, just come up with the the idea somewhere along the way that everything must come and go through them and i don't think that's a healthy way to lead at all um, which kind of leads into a second problem of the inability to ask the questions that need to be asked of the people you're leading. Uh, maybe not so much a 360 kind of review or something along those lines, but I'm thinking of uh, if you're not communicating with your people, uh, yeah. then what do you expect? Right. Uh, you know, what is it you're looking for? If you're not only communicating with your people, but letting your people communicate with you, I think that's a very key and critical issue in leadership today. Uh, a lot of the things that you see that don't go well usually are the result of a lack of communication. And quite frankly, I think sometimes the ego also causes us to become so full of ourselves that we lose our compassion. Mm. Uh, I think that a driver for today's work um, in the office or in the church or or wherever it is, I, th I think if we're not driven by passion, where we sense that what we're doing matters, that it's important, and, and if we don't portray that, not just to our people, but even in public as we talk about the things that we do, uh, I think that's that's a critical mistake uh, that is being made for people not to feel good about what they're doing, share what it is that they're doing, and be so full of themselves that it just doesn't matter what anyone th thinks anyway. And uh, maybe that's why leadership can be so lonely sometimes. Sure, sure. I get that. Now, Dave, uh, I'm going to throw another question at you that, that comes sure. off of this one. Um, if you were to Think about when I grew up, and I'm sure at some point when you grew up as well, um, we're not too far off in ages, but if we were to talk about somebody's capacity, we often would talk about things like IQ or academic standing. Uh, but in today's world, we're seeing a lot more importance given on things like EQ or emotional uh, intelligence. And I think that that's something that a lot of 
leaders that that maybe grew up a generation ago are struggling to to pivot on. Um, do you have any thoughts on that and and how you sort of help support leaders who maybe are going through that transition of perspective? Mm -hmm. Well, I I believe, and I like that question. Um, I believe the most effective leader is an empathetic leader. Uh, I believe someone who leads with their heart as well as their, their head is going to be the leader that is followed more freely than anyone else. Uh, I believe that uh, if we don't have that sense of compassion, now I'm not talking about being a, a doormat uh, for, for people to run over you or things like that, but even in management positions, it, part of the connection with the people that you manage uh, or the people that you connect with a client relationship either either way no matter no matter what the relationship is i think what the world really needs right now more than anything is that eq is that okay how can i best relate with you but also how can i do it in a caring kind of way uh, to show that i believe what you're doing is every bit as important as what i'm doing and how do we partner together how can we do this in an uh, amenable way that is going to benefit everybody, not just the people we're connected with, but also the people we all lead, no matter where our circles go. And that even trickles into things like family life. Right. If if I'm an uncaring parent, for example, um, my children and I are going to have a strained relationship for the rest of our lives. Um I don't want that for anybody. And I apply that. I think that that is best applied to leadership um, through the lens of my responsibility is to help others grow. Mm -hmm. And as a leader, if I strive to help others grow, then I'm not just doing a good service for them or to them or with them, but I'm also providing a good service for myself. Um, yeah. because yeah. I'm, you know, maybe it's because I'm at the age now where things like legacy are coming into mind. Sure. Uh, but, but still it's, it's one of those things where that is, that's one of the things that just drives me. Am I, am I leading in such a way that others are growing as a result? All right, Dave, I'd like to ask people uh, a question about what they're reading and what has been, you know, sort of showing them or helping them grow as a leader. So uh, that's going to be my question right now. What, what have you been reading recently that's helped you grow as a leader? I, I'll tell you, um, one of the things that um, has fascinated me recently, and I'm, I'm not just reading the book, I'm getting ready to do some teaching with it, is um, Pat, uh, Patrick Lencioni's um, working genius mm -hmm. uh, it's it's kind of a way to find your strengths you know there, there used to be a thing called strengths finder now it's uh, yeah. now it's called something else uh, but you know to help people not just find their strengths and lead from those but also to find the things that they can do well but it's not necessarily their top gifts and also discover the things that are just this is not my not my lane yeah. uh this this particular book does a fascinating job of breaking that down into six categories um to help folks uh, discover there is an assessment they've got an online assessment there's a fee for that of course there's right fee for most everything but um what, I, what i'm discovering though is as people are seeing this the relief they're feeling um as I've used this, in fact, I'm getting ready to use this for a church staff um, retreat. Um, but the the relief they're feeling of not feeling the pressure to do the things that they know they're not gifted at. Yeah. So for teams to develop, I, I see this as a really good resource, a great tool to help teams not only learn how to function together, but also to discover, are there any blind spots where some of these gifts are, right. are are just absent in the team so how do we cope with that but it's a fantastic resource working genius yeah that's great that's great um when you said that a second ago about um you know things that they maybe they shouldn't be doing i um I'm, i think back on one of the the quotes that resonates with me a lot as i work uh that was uh, steve jobs famously said that i'm more of of 
I'm more grateful or I'm more uh, proud of the things that we said no to than the things that we actually made. And I think that's just you know a very wise statement. Uh, from a guy who maybe sometimes wasn't the most emotionally intelligent person. He certainly understood, you know, the power in saying no and knowing your own limitations. Um, so I think that's a good word for us. Well, I tell you how that's working in my life right now. Uh, the last church I served as, as pastor, it went through a process of uh, that, that resulted in a closure. Uh -huh. You know, I helped them through a discernment process and, and it led to them passing the torch to another congregation yeah. and disbanding as a congregation. It was a very sad tale, but it was also a very powerful kingdom story. And when that happened, when that transpired, uh, that was the opportunity I felt God gave me to start Pep Talk Ministries mm -hmm. um, so that I could work with coaching and consulting and all these things to 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 help and and i've got a book that'll be released very soon about that um but the the primary thing that i've discovered is the importance of being true to your calling mm -hmm. um i have had other churches approach me since that time and ask in fact one just recently would you consider being our pastor and it is absolutely critical for me to say no to that because i do know now beyond doubt that my calling is not to do that anymore. It is to help the people who are involved with that. Right. Uh, so yeah, yeah, much much like uh, Mr. Jobs did become fond of saying, "No" became a, a critical word for me too. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's great. All right, Dave, I'm going to give you a parting shot here. What is the one thing that you would like for those who've listened to the end of this of? Uh, podcast what would you like to leave them with as sort of a final word of encouragement or challenge or invitation in a word breathe mm -hmm. we live in a culture right now that is just charged um the climate we are experiencing in 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 american life right now at least but certainly globally as well is everything seems to get everybody riled up. Uh, there seems to be no middle ground anymore. And all we hear are the voices of extremes and 80% and of us are not in the extremes of anything, whether you're thinking politically or even spiritually or you know, all these things. Most of us are not the ones who are given the microphones. Uh, and we're left to cope with life in the middle of all this polarization and things like that. Uh, this world right now needs people who are just breathing, who are, you know, the old calm, cool, collected. We need some level-headed leadership to be able to help folks to understand that, you know, the extremes have always been there. And they're always going to be there, but the rest of us just need to continue functioning and understand that the world isn't going to end because of what this group says or that group says or things like that. Um, just breathe. Well, excellent. Well, we all can take that advice and just simply try to breathe and, and, and be uh, present in ourselves. And Dave, I want to once again, thank you so much for uh, joining me today and taking the time to share with our audiences. And um, I wish you the best. If people want to get to uh, uh, reach out to you or, or to learn more about the book you're writing or uh, want to look at uh, coaching as an option, uh, how can they reach out to you? Uh, my website is peptalkministries.com. Pretty simple. Um, and, and everything is on there, how to, how to reach me, how to connect with me, how to schedule appointments and, and, and things like that. Uh, social media, I think, let's see, I'm, I'm on, I think, everything but Twitter. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, but Pep Talk Ministries LLC would okay. be the easiest way to find me, Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, things like that. That's the best way. Excellent. Well, go check them out. And uh, Dave, once again, thank you so much for joining us. And um, take care, bud.